Welcome to Cigar City Radio, episode 13, the first podcast of the year. I'm your host, Randy Ojeda, and making the magic happen is Jason Solanez. Well, here I am. Blickety blam. Thank you. You can check out our full library of episodes at CigarCityRadio.com. You can also find Cigar City Radio on iTunes or Stitcher. You can follow us at Cigar City Radio on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram, and you can email us at CigarCityRadio at gmail.com. Our guest on this episode is Grammy Award-winning record producer Jim Chambers, who now runs a sort of school of rock right in Carrollwood in Tampa, Florida, fittingly called Jim Chambers Music Box. The Jim Chambers Music Box is a full-service music instruction and learning academy, teaching all instruments including voice, piano, guitar, bass, drums, and band formation. They recently received a Creative Loafing Best of the Bay Award for Best Young Musician Incubator. The box has four young bands under management, Sick Hot, Heroes for Hire, Inkblot, and Extra Celestial. You can catch all these bands at the Heroes for Hire single release party at the Orpheum in Ybor City. To learn more, head to jcmusicbox.com or follow Jim Chambers Music Box on Facebook. This episode also features a, wait for it, wait for it, Cigar City Radio First. Yeah, the Cigar City Radio First. That's right. The very first live performance on Cigar City Radio by none other than Extra Celestial, one of the bands out of Jim Chambers Music Box. So stay tuned all the way to the end to hear an awesome performance from these young, talented musicians. We can't wait to hear what they release next. Follow them on Instagram at EXC Music and listen to their single Restart on Spotify and Apple Music. So here it is, episode 13. Hanging out here at Jim Chambers Music Box, Tampa's finest music academy, and it looks the part. <laughs> Thank you. Randy. It definitely looks the part. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we're sitting down with Jim Chambers, the proprietor of this fine music academy. You've been in the industry a long time. How long have you been working in music? Well, right during college, I decided uh, that there was a business within music, and I pursued it immediately. Uh, everything I did within college, whether it was writing a paper or working at the radio station, I started to focus all efforts on the music business. So straight out of college, I started to work for a very small indie label un- run by the Indigo Girls. Uh, oh, cool. Amy Ray. Right after college, um, I pursued uh, a job within the label system. I went from Valdosta, Georgia, that's where I went to college, uh, straight to Atlanta. Mm -hmm. So there's a very vibrant scene there. At the time, it was a very urban indie hip hop scene, whether it was LaFace or many labels were there. But I started with a label called Sky Records that had the Flat Duo Jets on the label, Um, primarily regional bands, but a lot of Athens bands too. And back then, Mm -hmm. when REM and the B-52s were leading the Athens pack, um, labels were snapping up those bands, and Sky Records was one of them. So we were snapping up a lot of Athens bands. Um, I remember I, I started there in the mailroom, and Amy Ray at the time was, you know, the biggest star around in, in yeah, my the world. Yeah, Indigo Girls. Yeah, right? I mean, <laughs> she, she was queen of Athens. So back in the mailroom, she started talking to me. Apparently, I talked too much. And she, <laughs> she went to the owner of the label and says, who's the kid in the back that won't shut up? Put him on the phone. Yeah. So sure enough, they put me on the phone, and um, I started doing sales, uh, indie distribution sales through all independent retail yeah. globally. And that's really where I got my feet wet with the record business proper. So you worked your way up from the mailroom. Yes. <laughs> a tale as old as time. She I found, guess. Yeah, it is. I, <laughs> Geffen started there too. And I was like, oh, I'm in the right place. I'm in a record label mailroom. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And then you use that to land a job. What is it? Sony BMG? Yes. From, from 
Sky, I worked there for a couple years, and then um, I really did want to f- focus efforts on, I always wanted to work within the major label record system. Yeah. And at the time, um, the coolest job in town was a merchandise rep, which essentially is a person that goes to retail stores and makes displays, just like in any retail environment. But we would make displays with marketing materials, posters and flats and stickers. Yeah. And we would go to all this, you know, whether it's Specs Music in Florida or Turtles or Peaches, we would go to those stores and do displays. And that was with Sony. Mm-hmm. Um, and they moved me to Miami. I was in Atlanta. I got the job with Sony, and they moved me to Miami to be their FMR at the time, as a field marketing rep. Mm-hmm. So that was my territory. Naples, Miami, or West Palm Beach South including Puerto Rico. So oh, those sweet. were my territories to hang posters for a while. So I was yeah. there. I did uh, about two years of merchandising in Miami. Um, I was then given a promotion to be a product development coordinator, a PDC. And Sounds very official. <laughs> I know, right? An alt PDC. Uh, <laughs> acronyms are you know, always within the music business. Yeah. Um, so what that meant was all of Sony's uh, – distributed labels, which there were many at the time, I think we were the second largest music company in the world. I would devise marketing plans for their alternative roster. And at the time it was Matthew Sweet, Tool, um, Dave Matthews Band was a big one. All of yeah. Sony's alternative the, roster I would do. Probably the only time you'll hear Tool, Dave Matthews Band, and Matthew Sweet in the same conversation. Right. <laughs> You're right. Yeah. And it was at the time Sony's alternative roster wasn't robust yet. It was still you know, getting through. I mean, some of the A and R people were signing, you know, Matthew Sweet, and then they'll try Fishbone for a minute, and then <laughs> somebody, the Bog Men for a minute, and just whoever it was, trying to get that alternative hit on the map. Yeah. Um, and it was my job to devise marketing plans for the Southeast from Atlanta. Mm-hmm. Um, I did that for about two and a half years. And I'm not going to lie, I was fired from that job. Oh, man. Um, I got into a, not a skirmish, but an argument that was very inappropriate, that was overheard. Uh, um, And back at the time where political correctness became very apparent. So I was let go from that job. I was devastated, honestly, um, because all I really wanted to do was work within that that system. So, Ho-Hum, this was 96 during the Atlanta Olympics. And uh, so fortunately, within about a half a year... Um, I was looking primarily in New York. This is in 96. Um, a small label called Hybrid Recordings, which was a division of Sire, mm-hmm. um, hired me as national uh, sales rep. So I was elated and couldn't wait to get there. So in 96, I moved to New York and uh, was appointed director of sales for this label. On the roster was Art Garfunkel, Morchiba, Rusted Root, uh, Mike Errico, Guster. Okay. Um, we've another, had... another wide range of Totally acts. bananas. <laughs> yeah. Like no focus for the label necessarily. And ultimately, most of these labels are now defunct. Wow. Most labels are now defunct. Yeah, most labels yeah. are. True that. Uh, so um, I worked for Hybrid for almost eight years, just pounding it out right on top of Madison Square Garden. That's where our offices were. Cool. And um, during Hybrids, while I was working there, um, I was actively seeking another job because in New York, you got to get paid. Yes. And I was getting paid yes. fine, but I really was, it was difficult. So I, my resume was everywhere and uh, a small label. They, they were, to be honest, they were courting me, courting me uh, as an, as an employee. And they had this cassette they sent me uh, by a band called Maroon mm-hmm. and I didn't think anything of it. This is right on the tail end of all the boy bands really kind of becoming defunct also. Boy, or not boys to men, but Backstreet Boys, yeah, all those cats. And all, those, yeah. all that was so played out. So here I, I'm presented with this, another boy band that could sing and do all those things, but could actually play, which tweaked my interest. And then I, I, I heard uh, a song by Maroon called Sunday Morning. And I thought that was like, God, that's a bona fide hit. Mm-hmm. So um, I was the first hire at this new label called Octone Records, and their first signing was Maroon. And within a couple of weeks of me working there, we had to change the name to Maroon 5. And um, we ran that project. That was uh, 
one of my latest successes, I mean, that's a last act that I worked with exclusively that really is in stratosphere. Well, at yeah, this I mean, point. they're one of the biggest bands in the world. In the world. Right? Yeah. yeah. And I worked the album Songs About Jane for three years straight, mm -hmm. trying to get that on the radio. I definitely think that's by far their best album. I'm sure most people would agree. <laughs> you know, that was that was really the one, you know. It, it For them, it certainly was. And it also changed the landscape of music. I mean, you started getting on all this jangly kind of pop rhythm sure. riff stuff. Um, and they, they kind of did set that. So they were credible. You know, yeah. I brought them all over the globe playing in uh, boardrooms at Target, at Sam at, or Sam Goody, whatever, you, all the record, you know, we did everything. Yeah. And we finally did get traction on radio. We were able to break them with uh, Harder to Breathe. Mm -hmm. And then This Love came out and really just popped the band. Yeah, man. Um, they were huge, and we rode those successes. It was wonderful. You know, That's it was awesome. just all your record label heyday business was, we were having full effect with that. It was great. Yeah. Um, so I was with, Octo, well, we also signed Flyleaf. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael Tolsher was on the label, who was just here the other night at uh, the new venue, The Attic. Yeah. Um, and actually, I went to see Michael, and he came and played one of our shows at Skipper's on Friday. Cool. Um, we're still buddies. Um, from Octone, um, I was laid off from Octone. As we had great successes with Maroon 5, there was a lot of over expenditures that I, I wasn't privy to, Yeah, but they had to lay me off. We signed Flyleaf. We did a bunch of South by Southwest stuff with them. A lot of Christian bookstore marketing stuff with them. Interesting. Yeah. It was yeah. critical that we break into that demo. Yeah, um, Cause I mean, they're a Christian band. Yeah. Right? So. First and foremost, huh. they only drive 50 miles an hour. <laughs> I remember that. That was one of their rules. Um, so that was let go or laid off with at Octone. I did a brief stint with VH1 in their consumer mar our music department, which was a really interesting ride. I hadn't worked for a large corporate company like Viacom. Yeah. And it was quite disheartening. I really didn't like working there very much. Um, I did love the lunchroom. I mean, MTV, <laughs> VH1, Comedy Central are all in the same building. Yeah, that could be fun. And that commissary, their lunchroom was just awesome. I mean, Kurt Ro Loader's right next to you getting a sandwich or yeah, all those guys were there. So that was that was a great ride, but I didn't like it very much. Um, so I was looking for other label opportunities. So I was at VH1 for about two years. And as I said you get to rub a lot of pretty great elbows with a lot of artists and um, you see them coming through the, the building every day in the elevator. So that was, that was a thrill in itself, but just the atmosphere of that company and the corporate culture there was just too much. I just wasn't accustomed to that. Yeah. Um, so I quickly moved on to another mega indie called Warcon and Warcon was a startup label um, owned by Kevin Lyman, who owns the Warp Tour. Mm -hmm. You know, he's a pope in our world. Yeah. Um, and Concrete Marketing, which is a heavy metal marketing firm in New York, quite famous back in the day. They broke Ozzy and Motley and everybody. So Concrete and Warp Tour made a baby and called it Warcon. And we had... Uh, I see. <laughs> yeah, Warcon <laughs> Records. And we had a great stable of artists. They were primarily Warp Tour artists, my American Heart, Lead the Dream, Deer and Gray, which is a crazy uh, yeah. Japanese metal band. Yeah, Deer and Gray is legendary. Yeah, they are. <laughs> they, and we had their U.S. Domest or domestic rights to distribute that. So we worked cool. great records for, for that label. Um, so I was appointed GM of that label. It was a big job for me. I was running the whole thing. It's about 40 employees. Uh, and I wasn't ready for it. <laughs> I, you know, I could sell things and I can market things and I can get things made, but to run a whole ship was a big step for me. But Kevin Lyman believed in, believed that I could do the job. So I did. Um, a side note with Warcon at the time, we were so excited about what we had created and everybody was so enthused with the independence of the label and the punk rock and the fan loyalty and at, with Warp Tour bands. It's just sure. unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. So w Wall Street came knocking at, uh, on the Warcon door and they wanted to invest 52% in that label to have control. Well, Kevin and Bob, the other principals in those guys decided to say, okay, let's let wall street bring some money to the table. We're able to expand this, that, and the other. Yeah. So they took the money. 
Wall Street approved of me as GM and kept me there. But within six months, that label was defunct because Wall Street really did cherry pick. Yeah. It took the hottest products on the roster, tried to exploit them, throw it at the radio board, see if it stuck, the whole thing. None of it worked against all of my, no, let's not do that. Yeah. Um, but sure enough, uh, Kevin and the other partner walked out. And uh, I worked with Wall Street until I turned the lights off at that label. Wow. And it was a bummer because we had a great thing. And coincidentally, we, when I started with 40 staff, we were at 20 in three months. We were at 10 in another three months. And I turned off the lights within nine months. Wow. And it was a bummer. That is a super bummer. But see, that that's the thing, though, is it's like, especially now, there's not as much money in music. No. So it's like you really got to be swift and you got to be nimble and you got to be able to roll with the punches and yeah you can't just throw a pile of money at it and expect it to work not at all not anymore and the money you spend is so smart now you have to be very smart about it um and back then we were doing quarter page ads and half page ads and all these magazines that didn't matter well that's the thing it's at a time when print is is failing and the industry is going through these rapid changes you might have more experience with this that the labels were really reluctant i feel to let streaming take over the way it has i mean i guess still that's going on you know obviously you know they fought for digital and itunes it was like right when itunes just started to become a thing right when people were like okay we're comfortable paying money for music it was like streaming came and now it's all wide open again we were all terrified of streaming and then i lived through the whole napster thing too sure um but streaming was just the death of us all i mean we saw it and all of our, you know, our consumers at that limp or the warp tour level, mm. we knew that that's all they wanted to do. Yeah. Let's every millennials want a subscription based service. So streaming made sense for them. And we were like, Oh my gosh, what are we going to do? Yeah. Um, Kevin saw that writing on the wall as the CEO of Warcon and was just like, guys, you got to hello. Are you not keen to what's happening? And we were, yeah. but we didn't know how to correct it. Well, there's there's no way it's like no. you, once the cat's out of the bag, it's like it's not going to go backwards, you know. Right. Now that it's there, now people aren't going to go back to like, okay, well I was paying $10 a month for all the music, so let me start paying $10 for one album again, you know, digitally. That's right. You know? But it's interesting though cuz in the rise of streaming, we've also seen a rise in, you know, vinyl sales and cassettes are back. So it's like people are buying physical product again to have that sort of connection to the music. But at the same time, obviously, you know, digitally streaming is basically the only game in town. Yeah. I, I look at it as game over and CDs will be toast in, I don't know, five years. Yeah. Definitely Um, CDs are out the door. And, you know, as much as I, I love streaming because I constantly try to experience music discovery. Yeah. Yeah. That's the best for me. Totally. And that's, that's Uh, my whole thing too, is I love hearing new music and, you know, with uh, a lot of the tools that they're having on these streaming services, like Spotify's got their Discover Weekly and like, you know, your daily mix and things where it's like, now I don't even have to think about discovering music. It's just new music is just there and at my fingertips. Like, right. That's mind blowing. I love it. I I have an Echo Dot and some, I'll think of anything. It could be Celine Dion Jingle Bells, who I really dislike, but it, <laughs> it'll come up. Yeah. I, I test it just yeah. to test it, see how deep will it go. Yeah. Well, I'll finish with at Warcon, as I mentioned, uh, mm. we t- I turned the lights off at that label. And then I was really contemplating like just getting out of the music game because, you know, at, at the level I was within the industry, it's like it, jobs are just fewer and fewer. Sure. And, um, I was desperately looking for another job. And fortunately one did come my way uh, with red eye distribution. Uh, I was appointed global head of A&R, which is a great job. I was ecstatic and thought that I could really take it places. Um, Red eye is one of um, the biggest indies out there. They probably have 400 labels. Mm -hmm. Um, Some of their biggest ones being Barsook, Daptone, um, hundreds and hundreds of labels. So at that label, I signed Loudon Wainwright, and we won a Grammy for it. Yeah. So it was like, holy moly, you know, couldn't believe it. And after we won that Grammy, um, I was laid off for other similar reasons, just cutbacks, money, et cetera. Yeah. And at that time, I decided I no longer want to climb this ladder in the record label system. Yeah. And opted to move to Belize and open a pizza joint. 
Really? <laughs> that was it. The, so <laughs> it all done now. <laughs> how did how did you go from wait? How did you go from I'm in the music business, I'm working in the label system to just you went you just went straight to Belize? Well, I'll back up on that. So I was at Red Eye and I was laid off again. And I I just decided there's no I can't I don't think I'm gonna be able to find another position in yeah. New York City in Q four mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah. again. Uh, so I'm, I had friends in Belize. I, I've been studying how to make authentic Brooklyn pizza. And that was kind of a goal. If this doesn't work out anymore, cause I'm tired of being laid off or fired, whatever it was, um, I'm going to open a pizza joint in Belize. So I went to Belize and they had enough pizza joints. <laughs> <laughs> I stayed there for a couple of weeks and that was right in 2009 when the economy really tanked. Yeah. So everything seemed to halt. So I've abandoned that idea. Um, my parents live in Tampa. They live in Carrollwood Village. So there I was uh, back in my high school bedroom. I did attend high school in Tampa. Yeah. Um, Where? If you don't mind me asking. Chamberlain High School. Right on. Man. Yeah, I went there. And so I'm back in my, my childhood bedroom wondering, what's plan B? I have no idea what I'm going to do. And I, I loved my career. I, I live for it. It's all I really wanted to do and all I know how to do. Yeah. So... Um, I, I honestly was kicking around ideas. Um, in Carrollwood, we have something called the Carrollwood Cultural Center. Yeah. Um, I went down there just to see what they're doing. I decided to teach drums in a group class for the heck of it, like very Jack Black style, like just wild, couple drum sets, let's start rocking, let's turn on ACDC, and taught, you know, eight to ten people every other day drum lessons. At the end of that session, all of those people wanted individual or private lessons. And they're mm-hmm. like, do you teach drums? I'm like, I do now. <laughs> so we, there I am in my parents, my bedroom in my parents' home teaching drum lessons. Wow. I couldn't believe it. I still can't. Push forward a year and a half. Uh, I went from that teaching 24 students uh, drums Some investors came knocking. They said, what would you really like to do? And that would be open a full-blown music school, teaching everything, Mm -hmm. but not in a retail space, not next to a karate shop. I want to get a big, giant house, make it like Hogwarts, and each bedroom (laughs) would be, you know, drums, bass, guitar, whatever we did. Yeah, yeah. And we did that. The school of the dark arts is, you know, school of I wanted that terribly. Yeah. And it worked uh, for about two years. HOA, Homeowners Association, Mm -hmm. I'm not too familiar with that said you got to be out of your mind you're gone so i had to get out of there but i didn't have the resources to do so um so i did a kickstarter campaign in march of 2015 we raised 20 g's and i moved into this space wow and um we've been open at the box uh since july 2015 so about a year and a half and we have about 80 students we have four bands and it's crazy i've never worked harder in my life and i'm really happy that's great that's amazing man so tell us a little bit more about this space because obviously our listeners are not here so they don't see how awesome all of this is i mean you got like beanbag chairs and stuff out front you got several music spaces where there's a whole you know drum band set up behind us so how did this space come together and like you know what was the idea behind it well i needed a retail space that had you know individual studios of sorts Mm -hmm. but offices um, so, you know, I scoured Hillsborough County for the right location. We finally came up with a decent place. Um, and I don't know what my design aesthetic is necessarily, but it's very mod, modern mod squad. <laughs> and I really did build it with a 12 year old's perspective. If I was 12 mm-hmm. and this is where I came to take music lessons, I'd be, you know, holy moly, this yeah. is the best place ever. But it, there's no kid elements. We don't even use the word kid. And there's no kitty stuff. There's no plastic kitchen set in the corner for the kids to play with. It's all very grown up, per se. I get it. Kids don't want to be talked down to. That doesn't make them feel cool. Yeah. Right. They're all treated as equals. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. We don't use kid or kiddo. It's all like, hey, John, how's it going? Yeah. Yeah. And they're learning music that's adult music and, you know, playing at a level that's, you know. Up, up there you know <laughs> thank you for the compliment randy it, yeah. it's a it is a cool space we love it and when people come they're like wow this is great and ultimately i think a music school or academy is only as good as its instructors mm-hmm. so we really do vet them to death and they have to teach me for a week before they come on board wow um and 
or jamming. It's a very boutique, very hands-on, very instructor-oriented where we have sit-downs with the students and the parents and decide, you know, what's a, what's a goal of mm-hmm. whether it be performance or are we working towards a recital. Um, so there's all it's very goal-oriented and performance-based. Yeah. And so you said you have four bands here. So are you yeah. finding, you know, some students that come in and they say, hey, I want to be in a band? Or is it just like you know, oh, hey, you know, Timmy's really good at, at playing bass. Let's put him with John, who's really good at drums, and see how they work. Like, well, how does how does that kind of fit together? Well, the box has been, now it's kind of known for our band program because it's fairly robust. But we try to pair students of likability. So I can't put a five-year drum student in with a one-year guitar player. So once I have kind of a a consortium of students that are of like ability, Mm -hmm. then I really do. I approach them. Have you ever thought about being in a band? And all of them want to be because they come to our shows. Yeah, who doesn't want to be in a band? Side note, I mean, when my students see their peers performing in a band that don't suck, it really inspires them to play. Yeah. So it's really kind of a a circle that works quite well. Um, But we try to pair like ability levels. And uh, we, it's, it's democratic. You know, I'll put them in a room first. Like let's, let's think about four songs that we could all agree upon that we like, have them prepare for a week. I bring them in the room, let them jam. And usually then we sit down and we talk and see if there's a, there's a groove or Mm -hmm. if they jive together. And if they do, you know, there's a lot of communication with the parents and also the students. And then we try to make a baby. Well, (laughs) a band. (laughs) Um, And then, our band program, we were just awarded the Creative Loafing Best of the Bay as band incubator. We're yeah. very proud of that. Well, and that's kind of what it is, right? Yeah. Is it is an incubator. I, You're just sort of encouraging these little startups to grow. And show them how to do it. Yeah. And believe it or not, the goal is for them to leave the nest or the box and develop their own legs, get their own fan base, have a social presence, get, they've got product, T-shirts, and leave the box and you know go be a band. We teach them that. Yeah, everything from you know stage presence, song creation, lyric writing, all of it. That is amazing. It's it, fun too. It really is the kind of thing that I wish was there when I was twelve or when I was thirteen. You Me know? too, because we had to learn a lot of those things on our own and make a lot of mistakes in the process. And right. you know, um, but that's really cool. It's a, and it's such a positive thing. You know, instead of so many kids nowadays just spend all their time on their phones and Snapchatting and other things that it's like, wow, now they're actually building something together as a group and making something that is, you know, art and and unique, you know? Yeah. It's, I love to watch it happen. I get emotional about it. It's, it's a beautiful thing and I'm thrilled that I'm able to do it. Thrilled. Yeah. Yeah. Did they show up? Yeah. Let me get them. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. No. Cause yeah, I'd love to talk to them a little bit too. Extra celestial. You are one of the bands here at, Jim Chambers Music Box, part of the music incubator system. How long have you been playing? How long have you been at Jim Chambers Music Box? You're gesturing. You're gesturing. <laughs> a little over a year. <laughs> a little yeah. over a year. Did you play instruments before you came here? I learned guitar through Jim, but like with the band, I had played guitar for about a year. Oh, right on. What about you, Casey? I have been singing since I was six. So. Oh, wow. You've been singing since you were six. How old are you two now? I'm 16. I'm 15. Oh, so that's that's definitely the youngest band we've had on Cigar City Radio. So kudos to that. You also <laughs> <laughs> you also are the youngest band to be on the cover of Creative Loafing. Yeah, that's yeah. amazing. Thank you. That is amazing. So you've been playing shows here and and doing mm-hmm. cool stuff. Do you write your own music? Yeah. Right on. Right on. And you're going to play something for us now, right? Yeah. yeah. Is it an original song? or Yeah, you... it's a song called Restart. Restart? hmm And this is a song you guys wrote. How did this song come together? How did it... Okay, so I had this, like, riff. It's, like, the very beginning riff um, that I, like, I don't know. I just played it for a while. And then when we decided to start writing original music, it was, like, the first thing that I wanted to, um, like, make into a song. And then... We kind of had the melody going, and then she wrote the lyrics. It kind of came together. So you collabed. Yeah. Yeah. I remember I was on a plane home from California, and I wrote the lyrics the whole plane ride, just thinking of what to write. 
That's awesome. Mm -hmm. This song is out now, right? People can listen to this. Yeah, it's been out since May. Right on. Where can they go to listen to it? (laughs) iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, YouTube. YouTube. Has a music video. Yeah, like basically anywhere google play yeah i saw the music video you guys yeah. recorded out in la yeah mm-hmm. yeah what was that like to just make a band trip out to la to basically. yeah well i have relatives out there mm-hmm. and so we got to perform for them and a bunch of friends out there that i have so and we decided to just tour around hollywood while we were at the gym or yeah. while we were out there so you? it was pretty fun it was nice that's awesome yeah so who are some of your influences who are some of the musicians and bands you're listening to Hmm. I'll leave that to Devin. <laughs> <laughs> like my biggest influence? Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, the song that made me like write the riff to restart. He told me about it. It's yeah. Yeah. hangers. That's that's what inspired like the riff for restart. But I, I would say I love David Bowie. Um, cool. Yeah, he's one of rest my in favorite. peace, David Bowie. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know. I, he's like one of my biggest influences. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to hear the song Restart from Extra Celestial here at Jim Chambers Music Box. You set my world on fire till it burned ashes on the ground. I cry with no Jingle Bells.